Aloha, this is Netra Halperin with Netra's News. So we've got uh, Ann Jenny here in the studio today. Ann Jenny, I'm very excited to have her with us. She is a former federal banking regulator um, with the Office of the Comptroller of Currency. Mm -hmm. And she currently is a professor, uh, instructor at U UH Maui, uh, University of Hawaii, Maui. Mm -hmm. And so um, Ann, Everybody's wondering, wh what is this recession? Why are we in a recession? Why are people losing their homes? Why are we having so many foreclosures? Why did we bail out the banks for all that money and yet we're still poor? People are still losing their homes. People are still uh, having trouble getting jobs. What's going on with the economy? <laughs> what, how many hours do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> um, even in an entire semester, I couldn't. I don't think I could answer the questions. There's a lot of factors that go yeah. into the entire equation. Um, so tell you what, break it down. Give me a small question to start with. Okay. Okay. So um, the bank failure. Mm -hmm. Why was there a bank failure? What was there a relation to subprime mortgages and the bank failure? All right. The banks failed because they are making highly speculative investments without um, adequately assessing the risks of those investments or, accu or, or um, effectively protecting themselves from those risks. All right. Um, because we have broken down the barriers um, with the failure of the Glass-Steagall Act, we don't really have um, the barriers that we put in place after the Great Reset. Great Depression in the 20s. We don't have barriers between what used to be separate merchant banks, what used to be separate investment banks, what used to be community banks. So all of our lending is done um, in, by a small group of, of banks now. And in order to get the greatest return, they want the most speculative investments, which of course are the most risky ones. And because we don't have those firewalls that protected our community lending from the speculative um, and highly risky securitized lending, um, we're, the community is now taking the risks that only those that were most able to um, to uh, monitor those risks are. Everyday people are taking those risks. When I take out a loan now, what I'm taking out is um, actually a small piece of a securitized loan that's going to be sold and sold and sold again. And it's those the speculation in those sales, in those uh, stream of payments that my loan uh, represents that actually um, uh, are, are what drove some of the banking failures. So it, it wasn't so much the banking failures as the Wall Street, um, the failure of the Wall Street risk managers. So, so basically, let's say I had bought a home mm -hmm. between 2003 and 2008, because that's what my understanding of when all these um, securitized, when it, w it was at, it, at its worst. Mm -hmm. So instead of me actually buying a house I was actually buying a security many times. That it, and what um, one of my uh, colleagues who uh, is a paralegal has said is that that instead of making the loan, that many times the banks were actually, or the mortgage brokers so were Debbie, actually. So Debbie, what is your experience of the economy in the last couple of? <laughs> Well, it looks like we had a little bit of sound from our woman on the street, but we'll get back to that later. So just know that woman on the street is coming next. So anyway, so as far as um, securitization, mm -hmm. so that many times instead of the uh, banks and the mortgage broker actually getting a mortgage, let's say you're you know, a MIDS homeowner, you come in, you say you want to buy a house, you, you s sign up for a mortgage, that actually that mortgage is, has been sold to Wall Street before you even signed your name. And so even though you think you're just buying a house and getting a mortgage, you're actually buying a security. And they're supposed to be, according to Securities and Exchange Commission, they're supposed to be, and so, um, like you said, those that are able to take risky Loans. Like if you gamble on the stock market, you know you're gambling. You can't come crying and say, well, I bought stock and it went down because it's, it's the stock market. But when you're buying a home, it's not supposed to be that risky. 
and and you're right. What happened was that um, in order to get a mortgage, somebody has to fund that mortgage. And the, the people that fund mortgages fund it because they want a return on their investment. By securitizing mortgages, what we've done is we've taken the funding piece of it away from banks funding loans to the securities um, bundlers fund, funding the loans. And what they were demanding was a better return. Now, interest rate are what pays for uh, pays for risk normally. So the higher the risk, the higher the interest rate. So what they were willing to fund was only the higher risk, high interest rate loans. They weren't willing to fund the more secure. Um, between 2003 and 2008, you couldn't have gotten a VA loan because nobody was willing to fund them. They were very low interest and very low risk. So even if you were eligible for one, you couldn't find one on the marketplace because the funders out there weren't willing to fund those particular sets of loans. And, and that's an interesting point that you bring up because um, some people have said, well, it's because um, you know, the, the government was trying to give loans to all those people and it's because people were buying um, homes that were above their means, as opposed to, it's not on the, it wasn't on the demand side, it was on the supply side. It was on the um, bond makers, the people that are, that were bundling all these securities together, all these mortgages together to make securities. They were basically putting the word out on the street, or i.e. the, you know, the mortgage brokers and the banks, give us more, give us more, give us more. Uh, do we care if they're um, high quality? No, just give us more, give us more, give us more. And so you sli slightly misspoke there. Um, the demand for um, low interest rate safe mortgages was not there. Yeah. Low interest rate, low. So the demand from the dealers, the demands from the securitization, the demands from the bundlers was give us these high interest rate, high risk loans. Right. And. Part of it was that there was such a tremendous volume, and with the consolidation of our banks, you don't know who you're borrowing from anymore. Yeah. You're borrowing from an entity that, you know, you know, one of your phone calls goes to Texas, another one goes to South Carolina, another one might go to North Dakota, and um, all in all, you're making a borrowing, not anymore from the banks, but from brokers, who are the middleman between the demands of the securitization market and the people that are trying to fund, get funds to um, buy a house. And I think when I said demand, I meant demand as in home buyers as opposed to demand as in uh, Wall Street, that mm -hmm. demand, that it's, it was fueled. And I think that's what I want people to be aware of and what um, I want to get across to people this evening is that the problem it was not the borrowers. The problem was not people buying more house than they could afford. The people bought houses that they could at that moment afford. Mm -hmm. You know, even with the stated, people don't buy a house to then, you know, give up their old place and, you know, change their address and buy drapes and move their kids. And they don't go through all that to be evicted, just like people don't, in general, buy cars they can't afford. People want to be safe and secure. So that it was um, the demand and the creation of this fiasco. It's just that I want people to be clear who created this fiasco, who is responsible, and then what the measures were or were not taken by our government because of it. I just want to have more clarity about that mm. for the general public. It was public. a confluence of so many different forces. The um, attitude on Wall Street of bigger and bigger and bigger is better, um, the more returns. There was a push, uh, if, if you're going to earn a billion dollars because you have um, created these, these mortgage loan pools that are paying these high interest rates, um, or are you going to be content to earn only a couple of million dollars because you've played by the rules? I mean, the, the, that greed was what drove a lot of it. Um, there, the speculation in the housing market, um, anytime you've got a bubble in any kind, whether it's in um, uh, 
the Silicon Valley type stuff, the, the high tech stocks, whether it's um, back in the, um, the it, it, it's exactly where I was going, the tulip bubble in Holland, I, 15 or 1600s, you know, where everybody was, was selling madly these shares in, 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 in tulip bulbs and things like that, looking for the elusive black tulip. Um, you know, uh, all of those bubbles are driven by by speculative greed. They're not driven by underlying value. And the other piece of it is we've shifted away from a market where you go out and you buy a house and you take out a simple loan to buy that house. We have so many layers of fees and charges and brokers and sales costs and things like that. Um, it used to be as easy as buying a car. You know, you would go in, here's your car, and you know, tax, title, and license, and transfer fees, it was somewhat of that. Um, now you look at a HUD-1 statement, you can't even get all of the details until you sign it. And you're, we're paying thousands and thousands of dollars to people whose only job is to um, figure out ways to generate more fees, essentially. So we, and then every time a house is sold, you have to try and recoup all of those fees. So a lot of the, the rise in the prices was not driven by increases in value. It was driven by people trying to recoup all of these fees and charges that have gotten added on, which you know they would pass on to the next buyer. So even though you know your house may have um, sold for more, it wasn't because of appreciation. It was because of both speculation in the market and all of these additional fees and charges. Okay. So okay, there was a depression, right? And then people freaked out and said, oh my God, we need to have some regulation to keep the different types of lending institutions separate mm -hmm. so that uh, high speculation and regular commercial um, and retail lending is not together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had the Glass-Steagall Act. And then over time, um, presidents of both the Democratic and the Republican Party mm -hmm. gradually got rid of that. Who do you think uh, well, was influenced? Well, the didn't get rid of it. They just signed the bills that Congress uh, passed. Yes. So who do you think, um, do you think there was a banking lobby that? Uh, oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, the, by limiting um, the amount of speculative investment, we limited their possible returns, right? And of course, it's like what I said about the brokers in, on Wall Street. If I could make a billion dollars by f doing far more, far more speculative investment, then I would do those type of loans or, or those type of um, those type of investments. If I'm trying to do, um, uh, you know, just everyday community banking, the greatest return I could get is probably about six percent. Yeah. You know, and you know that's not going to make me the multi-million dollar paychecks. And was there not a woman named Brooksley Bourne? Um, I actually watched a show about her. She was evidently, she's a commercial banker, a professor, I think at Harvard, um, and she was a friend of Hillary Clinton, and when um, Bill Clinton became president, he, she evidently went to visit him to possibly be Treasury Secretary, but evidently he found her boring. And so um, he instead gave her the consolation prize of putting her as the, uh, what was that? The Secure Future Commodities Exchange Commission. Mm -hmm. Is that the Commodities and Future? There are um, a number of different regulatory entities. Um, some that the commodities market is a very distinctly different market than the securities market, okay. which is a very different market from merchant banking. Um, there's the Federal Reserve, there's the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, there's the state banking regulators, there's the folks that regulate um, credit unions, there's the folks that regulate securities. Um, and so we've got this whole basket of, of regulatory agencies. Um, we lost one regulatory agency that was folded into the, the Comptroller's Office, the Office of Thrift Supervision. Um, even after the banking failures of the 80s, that was still kicking around. They finally folded it into the OCC um, about a year ago. Really? Yeah. So, but um, after after the bank it, uh, the banking crash, after the savings and loan crisis in the in the late 80s, in the early 80s, um, the Office of Thrift Supervision was um, was very much um, hamstrung. 
but it has it still existed uh, for another almost 30 years until it did get folded into the comptroller's office. You know, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has examiners. Um, they're trying to make sure that their insurance risk is managed. Uh, each each regulatory agency looks at a different set of, of issues in books. So let's hear the um, women on the street interviews, and let's just hear what um, what some people that I discussed this with at Safeway and um, at their shops thought. Okay. <laughs> it's a Oh, it's been tough, really tough. Um, like you said, I'm a realtor, my husband's a builder, and you know the economy turned and it was really hard. He got laid off and I'm a typical story. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm hearing every single day, really across the country, but yeah, it's been tough. And, and uh, some economists are saying that the recession is over. Do you, is that your experience? I don't know, I wish I had a crystal ball, because I mean, people ask us that all the time. Um, it's getting a lot better. I mean, I'm seeing huge improvements. The housing market is moving. Uh, very, very different than it was more than six months I, ago. I like, I, We're looking I, at um, a completely like, different market. But yes. whether it's over or not, I don't know. I mean, I hear that there's more foreclosures that are coming. Um, I don't know. Hi, Erin. I'm Netra. And we are talking to people. And we have a special segment for kids that we want to know what kids' views on things, because we think it's really important that the views of kids are expressed. Yeah. So um, Aaron, has the economy affected you and your friends as far as you know, not being able to do stuff you like to do or feeling afraid that you know, your family's not going to have what it needs? Or how has it affected you? Uh, it's definitely affected us, because you know, families are not without a lot of money anymore. And, like when, since all the prices have gone up, it's become harder and harder to do certain like activities that you want to do. Like, for instance, if you want to go to the movies, um, a few years ago it would have been great, but now it's like, just families are struggling through that, and it's just become more difficult. And and how do you feel? Does has it affected your view? I mean, it started when you were kind of young and maybe not thinking about these things, but has it affected your view of your future or your career prospects or your ability to go to college? Yeah, well, right now I'm definitely trying to like aim my way toward college, and I've had to think a lot more about like financial aid and getting grants, and it's, yeah, it's become like really, I don't know, just hard to... Hard to hope. Figure out what I'm going to do since, you know, the economy has just, like, slipped away. What is your, um, what are your career goals? Uh, well, right now I'm wanting to get into graphic design. Uh, yeah, that's a main interest for me. And um, I assume on, like, computers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's obviously a very important job. I have a graphic designer I wouldn't, couldn't live without. Um, so... Well, I wish you the very best of luck. Well, people have more choices when they have more money. In fact, I was, uh, uh, actually, there's a study now that really says that people are happier when they have more money. I actually have been quoted that, quoting that study, that it was that uh, money does buy happiness up to around seventy or $80,000. Basically, once you get middle class and you have your basic needs met, uh, it doesn't go up from that. But not having your basic needs met will depress you. Um, I think even millionaires will say that if they make more money, they're happier. Okay, well then that's a different study than I read. Okay. But um, absolutely, the, the, I, I, maybe there's like a huge uh, spike at, you know, once you get your basic needs met, then, the, then it, and then maybe it, it, it inches after that. Yeah, I think what we'll see um, in, in the next couple of years is real big, um, expressions of dissatisfaction like we're seeing right now in Greece where systems are falling apart. Um, I think we'll see social, social movements start to emerge about the inequality of, of, of wealth in the economy. Uh, what do you think is the effect of the foreclosures is on everyone, on the whole market, on the economy as a whole? Oh my goodness. I have to really think about that answer. Um, you know, I think it's really frustrating for people in a particular neighborhood when they've got a half a dozen foreclosures in their neighborhood. It's definitely affecting values, though appraisers are taking that into consideration when they're looking at value. Um, I don't know. That's probably the best answer I have. 
So, so you're just holding off. I mean, waiting. Wait. You're in a wait and see. You're just going to see. You know, how much will this affect the overall value of real estate in various neighborhoods? Yeah, it's definitely affected the value um, already. I don't know long term how it's going to affect. You know, from this point on, I don't know. It's just really difficult. And a friend of mine also who is going through the same thing, they raised her interest rate because she wasn't making as much money. She's been paying every month. And then she had, when she was trying to save her home, which so far she's been able to do, they she had to give them uh, her, her uh, report on her earnings, and they raised her interest rate. So for her taking the effort and the good faith measure of speaking up, communicating, and disclosing, they penalized her. Absolutely. Doesn't make sense, but that's the way it is. So I don't think that they really care. Well, that, that is uh, certainly a very uh, discouraging story. Um, so, you know, bear that in mind before you call the banks. Well, or know what you're doing before you call the banks. I think to be forewarned is to be forearmed. As a sign of the times on the level of unemployment, you were saying that it's pretty, there's a huge uh, group of people, pool of employees to uh, choose from, that you get, somebody comes in almost every day. Uh, yeah, I mean, at least one person a day, probably two or three, to be honest. Um, and I mean, it's, in a way, it's a good thing for us because we get a, a huge pool of employees to choose from, um, really qualified staff. We have a great staff now put up a great product, but I mean, it's just because there's so many people looking for, for work. It's, it's kind of a really sad story, actually, that all these people can't find a job. And I mean, most of them are so qualified, too. It's, it's amazing, so. You know, the stresses that come out in families uh, come out because people can't move out. They can't separate if, they f if they're uh, in a, a tough situation and want to separate or divorce. Here I sit all alone and I stare at the clock. I've been waiting for that moment when the sheriff will knock. Like so many others manifest in their dream, convinced by some professionals in some great Wall Street scheme. For the banks and the brokers, I had papers in hand. I had tax returns, pay stubs, maps of my land. Never had a loan, the bank I debated. Don't worry, they said. That's why we go stated. I gave on to them my bank statements piled tall. Oh no, said the bank, we need nothing at all. I thought to myself, well, how could that be? I didn't know about the paper feeding frenzy. Like so many Americans now living in shame, I was unaware of the securitization game. So, uh, do you have any comments about uh, what uh, people were saying? Well, I do have to agree that um, we are creating jobs. The problem is we aren't creating jobs that pay a living wage. And jobs that don't pay a living wage, the cost of living has to be paid somewhere else. So we have more and more people relying on um, subsidized housing, subsidized food, and uh, you know our food banks, and and you know moving in with relatives and, and things like that, just just to try and make ends meet. Even though they do have a job, you know people working two and three jobs were common here in Hawaii, but at least those jobs paid. Now you know it, it's really difficult to find um, even one job that pays a decent wage. Uh, that's 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 the biggest part of that. Um, part of the issue with the, with the regulatory reforms, when the woman was talking about um, getting her interest rate raised just because she her income had gone down, that would have been illegal under the old rules. The, a lot of the banking rules um, were there to protect the consumer, um, and they have gone away, which means that the um, the mortgage servicing agencies can, can play those kinds of games. Do you um, hold out um, hope for Elizabeth Warren's Consumer Financial Services The Consumer Bureau. Financial Protection Bureau. Yes. yes, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Do you think, well, first of all, I'm sure she would make everything great if she had the power. So do you think, basically, I guess, I heard that uh, President Obama, he put her forward. There was a lot of resistance, mm -hmm. I think, from uh, Republican uh, Congress people. Um, and he's kind of 
backing off. Do you think, uh, well, that's kind of asking you to look in a crystal ball. But um, I mean, I guess the key is, will she have enough, will that in organization have enough power to actually do something? Because I'm sure she would fix everything if she could. Part of the issue is the, um, the funding. Congress doesn't have to get rid of her. They don't have to get rid of the agency. They just have to not fund it, and, which is exactly what they're doing. That was one of the first um, items on the chopping block was any of the regulatory agencies. So let's, let's get some perspective here. Um, can we see the numbers, please, uh, the statistics about uh, the, um, the Wall Street uh, situation? Um, OK, so we've got right there, 1.4 trillion. That's the number of um, the amount of the subprime loans themselves, so 1.4 trillion. Then you've got the bailout of the banks, which is 13 trillion. So that's almost 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. So if these are the actual value of the loans, not even those that um, defaulted, but the actual value, why was the bank given 13 trillion? Actually, I'm not asking a question yet. <laughs> and then the uh, approximate amount of all of the money wagered worldwide, that includes like countries like Iceland, who, that's a really sad story. You gotta see the job, the, the movie Inside Job, it's an excellent movie. But anyway, 140 trillion, so you've got 1.4 trillion, 13 trillion, and then 140 trillion that was actually wagered on these little, little teeny mortgages. So that's why I want people to come away from this show tonight understanding that it's not the borrowers that created this problem. It was the speculation. Mm -hmm. Well, um, look at oil prices right now. The cost of drilling for a gallon of oil has not really changed that much, not in, in probably 10 years. But we've seen our oil prices jump, skyrocket. Part of that is is because oil, the prices that we pay at the pump are not set by the cost of what it the actual cost of drilling for a barrel of oil, but what a commodity's future contract is worth. Exactly. Okay, so because of the unrest in the Middle East, because of the, the uncertainty about the marketplace, oil futures have skyrocketed. Commodities started out as a way to help farmers, or commodities trading help as a way to help farmers um, get the money for their crops ahead of time. So they would, um, put out contracts for delivery of uh, 100 bushels of grain or 1,400 pounds of pork bellies or whatever else. Um, and then th the guesstimate of what that would worth based on, you know, what did we expect the weather to do, they, that was sold in the commodities market. Because this has become a worldwide issue, and you pointed out Iceland and some, none of the gentlemen pointed out Greece, Ireland is another loser in this game. Um, those those prices get bid up and get bid up and get bid up. So you've got the commodities piece there. Then you have people who are betting on the movements, all right? They're shorting things, you know, saying that, uh, or they're selling long or selling short, but generally what's caused the problems now is the short sales, which again distorts the marketplace. So you have a small amount of mortgages that become a big pool of mortgages that people are trying to guess, well, is this bubble going to be moving forward? Or is it going to be getting bigger? Or is it going to explode? All right? We don't know. But because there was so much uncertainty in the market and everybody was so rah, rah, gung ho, saying, oh, yeah, it's just going to keep going and going and going, um, they bid up those prices way, way, way over the value of things. So it wasn't the mortgages that they were paying off. But the um, people that had bought the secondary products and those people who had insured those mortgages, all right? Right, exactly. Every single one of those pools carried a loss insurance piece. Not just the um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac insurance pieces that you talk about when you get a mortgage, but 
Um, remember one of the first names in the failure system was American Insurance Group, right. AIG. Exactly. They lost because they had been insuring these loan pools which all of a sudden started collapsing under the weight of the speculation. So it wasn't the mortgages so much right. as, a, as the collapse of the speculative market that drove those things into the ground. And that's why this multiple multiplication of prices that you that you showed in in your um, in the statistics there that that um, uh, infl that price inflation every time you take it up an another level it's essentially like multiplying it by 10 which you exactly showed in the video there yeah and then one thing I didn't mention that was also on the statistics if the government the US government the federal government had taken that same 13 trillion <laughs> they could have paid off everybody's mortgage, not subprime mortgages, not anything, just everybody's mortgage in the mm -hmm. entire United States. They could have bought homes for people that didn't have homes. They could have bought health care for all of us. So in other words, they could have made us all sitting pretty. Every single citizen in this country would have been owning a house for, for mm -hmm. paid off. And instead, they took that money, gave it to banks who then didn't uh, free up capital. I mean, it wasn't like then they were out lending it, they stopped lending. So basically, we, many people feel very disappointed mm -hmm. that we, the people, Main Street, were not uh, protected, were not taken care of, and the banks were protected and taken care of. And there was this um, article in Rolling Stones called The Wives of Wall Street, and what they talked about is with the um, bailouts, it started becoming these non-recourse loans, which is loans that, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically that you, heads I win, tails you lose. Basically, if the loan went well, the person could then take the, their winnings and walk away. And if the loan didn't go well, they just say, uh, and just walk away. And they started giving them to more and more people. And then this, this article was about uh, Christy Mack, I think uh, she's the wife of uh, John Mack, what's his first name? Anyway, Mr. Mack, who is, I guess, uh, the head of, um, is it Goldman Sachs or one, one of the big. I've lost track. At but this anyway, point. one of the major brokerage houses. And she and one of her girlfriends did um, alternative medicine, which, you know, I totally believe in and is a great uh, cause, but the way it was done was not fair. So basically, you know, the, and then they all became bank holding companies, and so there was, it's, this you is- You and the, I should have become a bank holding yeah, company. Yeah, <laughs> why didn't we? What were we, I didn't have our eye on the ball, but it, but it was like um, the, 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 there's this thing called disaster capitalism. And what it is, is that um, corporate entities who take advantage of whenever there's a disaster to make money. Now there's even some people who say that they create disasters because when people are in panic and fear, they're vulnerable and that's when you can hoodwink them basically. And so what happened right after the bailout, I, I read a book called It Takes a Pillage by Nomi Prinz. I don't know if you got a chance mm -hmm. to read that yet, but it's an excellent book, you gotta read it. She, Nomi Prinz was a managing director on, at Goldman Sachs. And so, she, and then she became a journalist, so she's very, very aware of, of um, what's happening with this. But basically, after the bank failures, there was all this crisis and then with, with the, um, working together with the Treasury Secretary and the Chairman of Federal Reserve, they did all these fixes that were still sucking more money to the banks and less to the American people. And that's why we're in a recession, and that's why people say it's a jobless recovery, because, yeah, if the rich, if the super rich have more money, whatever, what I care about is the 99% of the people, can people pay their bills and lead a decent life? Was there a question in there? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. So, so let's hear the rest of the um, the rap uh, mom foreclosure rap. The mom's foreclosure rap. I just I did the first stanza in there, and um, okay. so uh, let's listen to that, or let's chat until that starts. <laughs> um, she's. Monitor there. Okay, so I guess. Uh... All about finance, I learned back in school. 
But nothing was taught about some mortgage pool. The economy all bad and about to go bust. I realized my loan, it was due to adjust. The bank reassured me when my home I did buy. We will refinance you, they said. Oh, but that was a lie. I remember those words with some angst and a frown. My home underwater, completely upside down. I called up my bank to get some justification, and I asked him in fairness for a modification. You're not in default. Your payment's on time. In order to help you, you must be four months behind. Americans were taught into our institutions to trust, so I listened to my bank and I did what I must. So with credit now ruined and I called to apply, I was put on hold till I wanted to cry. After waiting forever and throwing a fit, I was given a list of documents to submit. So I gathered up everything and I faxed them a stack. And so many, many months, I finally heard back. The response from my bank, well, it couldn't shock me more. There was a notice of default that was nailed on my door. Your foreclosure moves forward regardless, they said. And your modification now has yet to be read. The day finally came when I was assigned agent Clarence and the bank put me on some plan called forbearance. Three months I paid more than before, but those uneasy feelings, man, I couldn't ignore. Three months had passed and my payments on time. What the bank did next, oh God, it should be a crime. The bank wants financials and I asked them, well, why? They answered, because you no longer qualify. Well, what they said next, God went right to my core. In order to qualify, I must pay 10000 more. So I sold many things, big, medium, and small. The 10000 booty, the bank got it all. You know, I did all I was asked in my home to save. I prayed every night, and I tried to be brave. I never imagined in the end I would fail, but I knew it had happened. Notice of sale. The bank gave me a loan that they said was a must, and they promised to change it before it adjusts. Hey, no courtroom, no judges, no madams, no sirs. The money I'm gonna owe is to a machine called MERS. My loan was bought many times, and God, I don't know the source, but I will never find out who's. Holder in due course. I loaded my cat, dog, and kits in the car. I took the last cash from our small cookie jar. I felt so alone, frightened, sad, and so blue. If I could afford some lawyer, you know I would sue. But alas, the bank won. God, their back gets a pat. No attorney for me. They were counting on that. Hey, now read all about it and get really pissed. B of A pays six millions to investors on their list. Investors got their cash out of those toxic mortgage pools while I lose my home and my son can't go to school. Investors, they're not deemed to know the reps and warranties, not required to notice dotted I's and cross T's. Borrowers, they call us, you know, folks like you and me. Servicers say we're responsible. We signed the 1003. Investors, they got paid, and you know, no one disputed. Homeowners speak up, and we get prosecuted. Okay, so um, one thing that she just said about um, if I had money, I would have sued, and I uh, read an article about uh, Goldman Sachs um, sold some uh, investments to uh, Omar Gaddafi, and he uh, then they promptly lost 97 percent of his money, and and that it was like I don't know billions, and so um, he threatened to behead them, you know, the normal thing. And um, so, of course, all of the bankers in Libya at the time got their bodyguards, and then they, you know, shuffled back home. And then they went and they started offering, well, how about this, and how about this, and how can we ameliorate it? And um, they didn't give that same kind of star uh, offers to any people um, 
that didn't, uh, you know, threaten to behead them. So I think maybe, you know, I, I'm not advocating that, but I'm just saying. Um, uh, well, you know, Donald Trump always says borrow big because that makes the banks your partner. Makes it much harder for them. He's been in bankruptcy how many times now? I don't know how many. Uh, several, okay. uh, you know, and um, but he comes out of it every time smelling like a rose because the banks do everything they can to try and help him out of it. You that he's mm. uh, an example of why too big to fail is um, such a poor way of doing business. And um, okay, let's talk about modifications. Okay. Um, I know several people uh, that um, shop owner friend of mine and her uh, friend I also know, and I have several friends, and pretty much everybody says pretty, the exact same thing. I have given the exact same paperwork 10, 15, 20 times, the same paperwork, and the bank continuously, continuously loses it. And mm -hmm. um, my paralegal uh, colleague said that it's, she, her theory is because the banks are trying to string people along so they get past the statute of limitations, and then people cannot sue them. That could, could well be, I, I don't know, um, you know, not being in the industry, um, it would be hard to say. Um, that's a possible reason. Um, you know, when you take out a loan now, uh, if you go buy a car, they spend more time trying to sell you a particular loan package than they do trying to sell you the car because you're no longer seen by the financial industry as just a simple borrower. You're seen as a stream of payments, right? And those payments are something that they can bundle up and sell on the secondary market. So if there's some sort of interruption in that, um, they're not able to to sell it the way that they would. So it's also to their benefit not to modify things, not to change things, because then they have to pull your stream of payments out of the big pool of payments that has already been sold on Wall Street. And, and I think that's an excellent point that you're making is that um, many times the investors, and that's what is really important to remember, is the investors and the banks are not the same entities. The mm -hmm. investors are often, you know, New York City Fire Department Pension Fund, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, Maui County or, you know, State of Hawaii. Uh, both, both of these entities bought securities back in 2008 or 2007. Uh, and then they got caught in, I think it was Merrill Lynch was one and Citigroup was another, where there was some um, funny business going on where the, the um, brokerage company was uh, representing that the securities were more liquid than they were. So in other words, there's securities fraud, there's all these mortgage fraud. And the other thing I wanted to mention is um, investments, the investors for these mortgage pools are, as I said, they're usually these entities. And these entities are required to only purchase triple A rated securities. That's because, you know, you don't, as you know, the pension plan, you don't want to lose all their money. Mm -hmm. And there's um, uh, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and then Fitch's. Those are the, the, primary the primary rating agencies. And they were rating almost everything triple A. And then they were taking the ones that were not triple A and then they were taking the best of those in AAA. And so they're like repackaging and repackaging and repackaging. And uh, one reason I think they were doing that is that they were paid by the actual um, mortgage, uh, sorry, mortgage, the um, investment funds, that the investment funds paid to get themselves rated. So there's kind of a conflict of interest there. Mm -hmm. and. So when you were working, um, and I guess back to the whole issue of, of um, uh, regulators, and that's kind of the bottom line problem, is everything about our lives are regulated, whether we build an attic or not, whether we do you know, an addition on our house, um, driving, we have to get our license, um, even you know, with no child left behind, even five-year-olds are regulated. They have to be taking these tests. So everything about our lives are regulated, except for the finance industry, which has trillions. I mean, people are arguing about, well, should we cut spending in welfare? Should we cut spending in war? Should we cut spending here? That's all manini compared to the dollar amount that is being lost on Wall Street. And that's what people aren't really understanding, how big that is. And that's why our country is in a recession. That's why people are getting poor. Mm -hmm. 
And then the other thing that Elizabeth Warren, I um, actually you had me watch a, a video about a, a lecture that she gave, the coming demise of the modern of the middle class, the coming collapse of the American middle class. Right, and this was done in I think 2000, 2007. It was a lecture that she gave at Berkeley. Right. So before before it started. Uh, Falling. And what she pointed out is that then in the last, it's like 20, 30 years, that like think about it. When we were kids, one parent, only one parent had to work, mm -hmm. and then one adult could actually support an entire family. And then women said, oh, we want to work. And obviously, you know, we should have that right, but it shouldn't be required to bring to support a family. And so as um, more people, all these women join the labor force, the wages stayed the same and the costs, inflation, and that's, that's handled by the uh, Treasury, right? That's who, it isn't um, the Treasury, the U.S. Treasury, I'm sorry, sorry, the Federal Reserve. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, yeah. she's the expert on these things. The Federal Reserve is what is trying to modify. Um, the role, the um, charter of the Federal Reserve calls them to um, promote growth uh, can help control inflation and ensure um, a low unemployment is, is supposedly the charter. Now remember the Federal Reserve is not a government entity. And, and I had somebody get really upset at me on Facebook that by saying the Federal Reserve is a private bank. But you, Ms. Federal <laughs> Banking Regulator, are saying the same thing. Exactly. Um, the, the U.S. Treasury is a government entity. The Federal Reserve banks are a, a set of 12 banks in, in 12 regions of the United States that have taken over what is normally the role of a central bank in other countries. And central banks are the banks that are actually the, the government entity that is a bank. So um, they're very secretive. Um, they, we can't look at their books. They're and privately didn't owned. In the, didn't that change in the last year? Mm, not really. No, uh, they're still pretty secretive. But wasn't Congress allowed to start pouring through their books? I, I know that they were looking at things. I know that mm -hmm. I've been reading articles about that. You're saying they're still not allowed to look at everything, or what's the problem? Um, it depends on when Congress looks at something, they have to put out a list of exactly what they, it's not like the Federal Reserve uh, banks opened their books to Congress and said, go look at whatever you want. Congress would have had to send them a list of, we want to look at this, 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 and this. And they might not think of the things in the places that it was hid. And if you were in charge. <laughs> if I was in charge? And if you were in charge, uh, what would you do to, so you're saying a, a, a central bank is different than a Federal Reserve. Would you um, change our, our system to one with a central bank instead of a Federal Reserve? And what is the difference? Um, the difference is anytime you privatize something, you give up oversight of it, all right? Um, when, uh, for example, in the military, um, when the cooks and the uh, road builders and everything were all members of the military, they were all subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, they were all part and parcel of the same agency. We had all sorts of people that were looking over their shoulder all the time. The idea of a, the Inspector General was a, a, was a real force in making sure that things were handled properly. When we started privatizing that, we lost that. Um, now, you know, Halliburton can get away with enforcing unfair labor contracts. Um, some, some real ugly things. Like, some really so, nasty Like women stuff. can get raped and they can't even... They uh, can't sue. They can't sue. I right. mean, that's yeah. not American. Um, and, um, you know, I've had friends electrocuted because of poor work done by, by uh, I guess it was KBR and things like that. So what happens when you privatize things instead of having you know, the, um, the CBs or Red Horse, depending on which branch of the service you're in, um, who, are part, who, who you work with and you fight with and you talk to all the time, you've got some private contractor out there who's saying, well, in order to, for a profit, in order to take this, take care of this, um, you know, I'm going to cut corners everywhere I can so that my bosses can make a profit. You just made me think of private prisons, but that's a different show. So uh, <laughs> look forward to that. But, but basically, the profit motive, um, 
And, and to me, it's like, what is government for? And the way I look at government, my theory is it's for collectivity. You know, like everybody, we need roads. Everybody's not gonna build mm -hmm. their own roads. We need utilities, and I know many utilities are private, but then we have the PUC to uh, monitor them. And so we need things that are collective. And in my view, it also should be about bullying, about stopping bullying. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see the regulators for the financial industry is like, and you've talked to me at previous times about credit card, how it used to be that, you know, 14, 15, 29% would be considered usury, and now they're getting away with it. And, you know, we need collect. The mafia has gone legitimate. <laughs> yeah, basically, there, there's a book. The best way to rob a bank is to own one. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we have all these issues. What can people do? You know, I don't want to just you know put all this information out to people and have people feel uh, depressed and overwhelmed. I mean, I, I'll give my opinion. But what is your view? What do you think can help? Um, I think one of the best things we could do would be to understand that the regulators are not the bad guys, yeah. right? We're not out there to stop jobs. We're not out there to stop growth. Um, I'm a, an adamant capitalist, you know. Um, I believe that people's self-interest does drive what we have. But um, you wouldn't have uh, a football game between uh, a junior college and a pro team and, you know, and expect it to play fair. Um, the regulators are essentially the referees in the world of, exactly. of, a, of a capitalist system. Um, we're the people that were responsible for pointing out when there were abuses of the system, when there were abuses of power, when the bullies were in charge. So uh, the first thing I would say is to, to understand the difference between regulations that are out there to protect the corporations and to protect the big guys and the regulations and the regulators that are out there to act as the referees for the rest of us. Right. And there's very different rules there. I mean, saying, giving a tax break so that somebody can write off their yacht under a mortgage deduction is very different than, um, than, a, than a regulation that says that if you're going to adjust the uh, rate, the interest rate on somebody's loan, you have to adjust it tied to a index that is publicly available. Right. That you can't just do it on some random basis because they lost their job. <laughs> Right. You know, that those regulations that that we were so quick to get rid of were what protected us from the abuses that have led to the crises that we have now. And and what you're talking about is uh, publicly available information. Um, a friend of mine is tr was trying to get a more modification and they did an MPV, a net present value. Uh, on her on her home to decide whether it was in the best interest of the investor to give her a modification or to foreclose and this is an individual who actually could have sold her house and was um, instruct advised not to sell her house by the bank they said they'd give her a modification within three months two years later they haven't given her one she missed the window of opportunity to sell her house rent and then now buy a house mortgage free because of this whole modification scandal or shambles. It is a scandal. Scandal, shambles, travesty. But basically, lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. the, the NPV, I mean, it's a bunch of information. It's a bunch of numbers. You know, they, they decide what is, um, yeah, what is in the best interest of the investor. And they're not, they wouldn't give it to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, net present value, fair market value, um, you know, that, that should be, um, that should be something that I could pull up. And there are sites and, and things where you can look at it. Um, anybody who's ever been a realtor knows how to find out the, the uh, current value of a property. Um, but do we know what information that they were using? You know? It wasn't just, it, comparables was part of it, but the also the part of it is, you know, okay, how much equity does she have? What is her uh, credit worthiness, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, So they weren't looking at net present value of the house, they were looking at net pre present value of the stream of payments. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It goes back to what I was saying is that the, the financial industry no longer is interested in what it is you're purchasing with a loan. They're interested in you as a stream of payments. Exactly. And the other thing I wanted to point out is, the way, okay, the Glass-Steagall, okay, there was the Depression, then there's the people freaked out, then they in, instituted the Glass-Steagall Act, which separated these various branches 
of our, our types of uh, lending institutions, basically to create stability and, mm -hmm. and to they, take they away risk. They separated rest. out the, the various types of, of investment opportunities. Right. All right. Right. Um, a bank can invest in a mortgage. To a bank, a mortgage is an asset. A loan is an asset. To a securities dealer, um, securities are their assets. They're you know they're selling different things. Right. And by keeping those separate and by really understanding the various risks associated with the various products, um, now it's no longer the value of the, of the, um, of the, the loan, you know, nobody wants just simple interest because one of the other things we gave up was um, it used to be interest rates were fairly well fixed. You know, we started letting them float in the 70s, which led to the thrift, um, the savings and loan crisis in the 80s. Um, but we've also taken away all, a lot of the other uh, controls on the system so that uh, people aren't making money on just interest anymore, they're making money on the fees and charges. Right, exactly. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, basically the banks and the uh, investment houses have very, very strong lobbies. and. They have been lobbying the politicians, and it's also because of um, we have privately financed campaigns. So I wanted to talk about public campaign financing. That basically, instead of it being one man or one person, one vote, it's become one dollar, one vote. And so, um, so as a candidate, somebody goes and they, you know, try to get money and. Whoever gives them money in the capitalist system is their boss. Mm -hmm. That's the real world. Whoever pays you is your boss. So then the boss isn't the people. The, their boss is whoever gives them money. And so even if they're very intelligent and you know have a good heart, if they don't do what their bosses want, they won't get the money next time, and then they will lose. Mm -hmm. And and because it's cost more and more and more at the federal level especially to run, you know, you don't just raise some money. You need millions to run for president. You need billions. And so six uh, states already have what's called public campaign financing. And that's where the candidate runs around, gets X number of um, signatures from their district and maybe $5, something that most people can come up with. And then the, the state or the federal has to give them whatever the money they've ascertained. And then that candidate could diss the state or the, the, the federal government all year and come back the next time with all their little signatures and they'd have to get it again. So it, it makes a level playing field and it makes for more integrity. And so that's what I am uh, promoting, that mm -hmm. I think that's one thing. Because until we get the money. Public financing campaigns. Right? Yeah, until we get the money out of politics, it's not going to be clean. It's not going to be for the people. It's going to be for the corporations and the financiers. That's just logic. Mm -hmm. And it's the, you know it's the, those people with lots of money that we're paying for the uh, Congress people to get rid of the regulations. Exactly. So thank you so much for joining us here. Again, this is Netra Halperin with Netra's News. Please come watch us again. Uh, we'll be live again in two weeks, or you can watch the show again in a week and on Channel 52 and Channel 53 again. So thank you so much. Um, it's been wonderful having Ann and Jenny here in our studio audience. I think it's uh, there's still time to run down to MCC and uh, sign UH up. UH Maui College. UH Maui College and <laughs> sign up for her class. Um, wealth of information and by the end uh, you will be a uh, a scholar in economics <laughs> economics for real people economics for real people none of this uh, too esoteric and you know things that don't even make sense you know economics I mean that's money you know well, it's the, more than money it's it's everything that we yes. live it's decisions that we make <laughs>